you've got governments that are talking about build back better, but you can't have a build back better unless we find solutions and jobs for people. So if I take a look at Thunder Bay, it's a, you know, a, a small community, I would argue. But when you start losing jobs in your number one private sector facilities, people start to leave the community. So today's announcement was really about saying to those young people that left to the community, come home, come back to your families. There's hope. And this doesn't happen without our organization pushing and pushing and pushing and meeting both levels of government and pushing and sometimes not all that calmly. But we got it done today. But another piece of great news that came down yesterday, because our unions and everything, I mean, and I'll talk about some of the stuff that we've been doing. I know a lot of you have been watching it. But yesterday there was an announcement in Mexico that said the Mexican Labor Relations Board is interfering and has shut down a vote with the GM workers in the Celayo plant. It's a major General Motors assembly plant. Why? Because the CTM, which is the corrupt union that is in pretty well the majority of the Detroit three of the automotive industry in Mexico, the auto parts plants, the CTM, which are the owners of the protection agreements where the employers will sign a contract with the CTM, which is theoretically a union, which it's not, sign protection agreements. We call them yellow unions. And as a part of NAFTA, where we played such a major role, so many pieces of NAFTA have our fingerprints all over it. So this was the first real test about the language in Mexico that says the worker is going to have the right to join a legitimate union. They're going to have the right to join a union of their choice. So here they're voting to leave the CTM and bring in an independent union, a real union, and the corruption, the interference. So we got involved and we contacted General Motors and we sent a letter to the CEO of General Motors and we sent letters to the, the, those responsible for General Motors for the NAFTA region. And then, of course, the letters found their way into the Mexican newspapers. And then the Mexican newspapers got a hold of the response from General Motors to us saying unequivocally, that they stand by the workers' right to choice, that if they deserve to belong to a union of their choice, and General Motors, no way, shape, or form, is going to tolerate any corruption within that discussion. So yesterday in Mexico, the Labor Relations Board shut down the election, and we're going to be having another vote in 30 days. So the biggest challenge for myself is how the heck do I get the federal government to let me in and out of the country to go down with a small uniform team to monitor the vote. Because that's what it's going to take in order for us to win real justice. And as an organization, we can't just only concentrate on the struggles that we're having internally. And heaven only knows we've got a lot of struggles internally. But we have to care about what's happening around the world as well. And that is a huge huge statement that's happening here uh, today in Mexico. And it's a huge, uh, it's a huge victory for our union and something that we should collectively be proud of because we are clearly making a difference. And you know, we're making a difference because I just received a text from the senior labor relations, human resources person from Boeing aircraft. And of course we have our Boeing facilities in, in Winnipeg. She sent me a text saying, I see your post NAFTA work is paying dividends. So when our employers are watching and they're watching and they're seeing what we're doing and you got to know it makes them a little damn nervous. So we're getting people's attention and we're going to continue doing that. So obviously we're following what's happening with line five with the governor of Michigan that's talking about shutting down the pipeline and the impact that that's going to have. Uh, and our members in Alberta, Saskatchewan, uh, the, the impact that it's going to have, we probably got close to 5,000 members uh, in, in Ontario, that will impact. So do I believe the pipeline will get shut down? I, I, I don't think so. 
but it's good to see our governments are fighting like hell and having conversations uh, with the U.S. government to make sure that it doesn't happen. So we have our hands full. And look, like I said in my opening remarks, this isn't how we want to do things, but you know, when you're dealt lemons, you make lemonade. And we're all over the place. And we're pushing and pushing and pushing like no other union in this country. And I think about our impact. And I think about our voice. And I think about our fight for funding for the media sector. And I think about the other essential services. I think about our PSWs. I think about our grocery store workers. I think about our transit drivers. Like I said, our, media, our workers in the media sector. I can walk through the list of our members in airlines, hotels, workers who have been ravaged, our members who have lost their jobs, our members that are going to work scared each and every day because they're wondering if they're going to be one of the like one of the 1.2 million Canadians that have tested positive. They're nervous about being one of the 25,000 Canadians that have died as a result of COVID. And there's no stronger voice than ours that are pushing. I kick the hell out of Galen Weston and Loblaws at least two, three times every week. They make me sick. I read an article in the paper the other day with the CEO of Canadian Tire, the CEO of Loblaws, the CEO of Chartwell Long-Term Care Facilities, how their bonuses were larger than their salaries. And they pat themselves on the back because they said they did an incredible job of dealing with the pandemic. I think about Loblaws, Metros, and Sobeys, where they implemented the pandemic pay from March and canceled it in June of last year, saying it looks like things are getting better. To, Two massive outbreaks later, variants. We're worse off today than we were then. And they're announcing record profits and incre incredible bonuses for their CEOs. Makes me sick. I don't know how they can look at themselves in the mirror in the morning. They make me puke. But it's these types of rich, thoughtless, ignorant individuals that push us each and every day because we need to be the ones that lead the conversation. If you can imagine the CEO of Chartwell long-term care facilities where there are so many deaths, got an incredible bonus because of the what he claimed and his board claimed navigating during a difficult time. But at the same time that they were voting his incredible bonus they shot down a proposal brought forward by shareholders that said that their employees should receive a living wage and that Chartwell should investigate, not do it, investigate the feasibility of introducing a living wage. And the same people that took the bonuses shot it down saying, we can't be talking about a living wage during a pandemic. Yet it was the pandemic that they used to justify their, you know, their outrageous bonuses. There's so there's so much going on that infuriates us each and every day. Because greed has no conscience. And it's living out in living technicolor. Now, today's announcement with Bombardier is huge because one thing that the pandemic has done, it really has sparked a renew interest across this country of jobs that are necessary in order for us to move forward. Because you keep hearing about, oh, manufacturing jobs are gone. They're the way of the dinosaur. We're moving to the gig economy. Yet when the pandemic hit, who did we depend on to save us from ourselves? So many of the manufacturing plants had to step up to make personal protective equipment. We found out as a nation how incredibly unprepared we were to deal with the challenges of the day. The plants we had that made vaccines all left. We couldn't even make a damn 
mask. Nothing. So all of a sudden, here we are today as a nation saying, uh-oh, we couldn't even provide the basics. So when we talk about Build Back Better and when we start talking to governments and when we're pushing governments and are we ever pushing governments, I would expect that people will learn from their mistakes and that we'll move forward because we can never get caught like this again. And I'm fascinated about how the conservative premiers are frankly doing even worse. Take a look at the rampant variants going across this country. We've got about 7,000 new cases every day in Canada. About 3,000 of them are in Ontario. And if you take a look at the governments that are doing the worst, Jason Kenney gets the gold star for being the most irresponsible. Scott Moe, numbers are going through the roof. Brian Pallister, Doug Ford. Why? Because it was ideology before people. It was about keeping the workplaces open. I'm always fascinated when they say that we're keeping the essential workplaces open when we all know that so many workplaces got stayed open were not essential at all. How does a factory that makes furniture, makes sofas, I can start to walk through some of the factories that have remained open that have been anything but essential. You know, it's not all that long ago, I think about the outbreak of the Cargill plant in Alberta. And what Jason Kenney did, and more importantly, didn't do. And then I take a look at the breakout in the Amazon warehouse in Brampton, Ontario, and some of the other food processing plants. And if you listen to the corporations and if you listen to the governments, you'll think this is the first conversation we're having on a pandemic. And I think about our ICUs. And I think about our healthcare system, which has never been so stressed. Our ICUs that are completely full. The movement of our families, the long-term care facilities, because there's no beds available in ICUs across the country. And yet you've got the Jason Kenney government talking about eliminating healthcare jobs, replacing many with contractors. Who would even think about it? So we are in trouble, I will argue. And I can't believe the debate we're having from coast to coast to coast on paid sick days. We're slowly, slowly, slowly embarrassing the different governments into introducing some form of paid sick days. But it's not enough, and we all know that. We all know that. So what the heck is the problem? We've got governments are saying, well, we know there's a federal program, but we all know the federal programs suck. There's no uniform policy across the country. I mean, we've got John Horgan, our friend of which myself and Gavin and Joey and others have had discussions with John directly and with his variety of ministers. And we haven't exactly been, weren't exactly pouring on the charm. We said, look, John, I've got right wing conservative premiers across the country that are saying to me directly when I'm challenging them, what about your friend in British Columbia? That's what they're saying. So we know, of course, that they've now introduced some paid sick days in BC uh, for during the pandemic, and there's talk about it being permanent. But it's about damn time. So we got to keep pushing and pushing and pushing because we all know that our members are in the front lines and our members are exposed every day. April 28th, just a couple of weeks ago, 
18th workplace related deaths of our members across the country. With of course so many fisher people on the East Coast, so many of our members every year, every year the industry with the most workplace deaths are, are our friends and family with FFAW. And then of course we've had 10 COVID deaths. So the pandemic has made everything incredibly worse, but I'm frustrated by how little governments seem to be stepping up the fight. We have been pushing and leading the debate about eliminating for-profit long-term care facilities across this country. We know where the majority of deaths were in this country as it related to COVID-19. Our parents, our grandparents, our family. And we still can't get governments to step forward to eliminate for-profit. I took a look at the last federal budget of where they've put into place $3 billion to start the transformation as it relates to uniform regulations within long-term care. And hopefully that'll start to lead towards more publicly owned long-term care facilities. But then I take a look at the impact that we had on the last federal budget. Was it perfect? Oh, God, no. We know that. But it wasn't bad because it's about time that we put into place a national childcare strategy in this country. $50 billion over five years, $9.2 billion in 2025. And because we know it makes a difference, it's about eliminating barriers that have led to inequality. And we've seen what's happening during the pandemic. We see that women are returning to the workplace at a much slower rate than men. Indigenous workers, workers of color, predominantly hit hardest by the pandemic, slower to return to work. So the pandemic has shown as if we didn't know the extent of our inequality in this country. So these are all the issues we're dealing with. And that's why if we're going to talk about true equality between men and women, we need a national child care strategy in this country because we know the numbers. If you take a look across the country, Quebec was the worst province when it came to having women at work as a percentage of the population. They introduced a $15 a day childcare strategy. And today, Quebec has the highest rate of women per capita in the workplace. 100% switch. The numbers are there. So that's why the implementation of a $10 strategy is something that we have been fighting for for years. And we got to make sure that it doesn't drop by the waste side. And I'm also pleased with the amount of money that the government is putting in in stimulus packages for Build Back Better, because we have been the strongest voice across this country as it relates to jobs and what the economy has to look like when we get through this pandemic. There has been nobody that has fought harder for airline workers than our union. Our fingerprints are all over the Air Canada deal. Our fingerprints are all over some of the other packages that are being bargained today for some of the other airlines in this country. Our fingers were all over the federal government as they earmarked hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars for the aerospace sector here in Canada. I can start to walk through the different industries that we are having incredible success ensuring that the governments understand that they have to do more and so you watch what happens if, in fact, there's a federal election. Watch how some of the parties will say they've, we've overspent, done too much, should be pulling back. We're going to need some more austerity. They're not saying that today, but watch what happens during an election. Now, if you take a look at some of the programs that have been implemented, we should be proud of ourselves because 
as an organization, Atlanta Paid, our incredible secretary treasurer, my team, my assistants, the regional directors, from the time of the pandemic, as we are watching it in Europe, and we are following the cruise ships returning, where people were sick and people were dying, we moved. We set up governments with the meetings with the federal government saying, look, you better move it. There's a lot of workers, precarious, part-time, non-standards that'll never survive this. The restaurants are going to shut down. The hotels are going to shut down. What are they going to do? The EI system is such a disaster, they'll never even qualify. And with that came CERB. And then I never thought the day would come that I would join with the Chamber of Commerce, the manufacturing associations to say a 10% wage subsidy sucks. You got to do 75%. And then, of course, we saw the government act quickly and put in wage subsidies at 75%. So I can start to walk through so many of the programs in place that we have lobbied for and pushed for and in many circumstances designed. But we know that the first thing that crashed was our infrastructure, our social programs. We found out how terrible our EI structure already was because we knew that 38% of Canadians only ever qualified for EI in the first place. So we know the changes in the last federal budget now means that about 75% of people will now qualify for EI. If you're a woman, it's closer to 80% now, which is a huge, huge change. But once again, all of the presentations we've done at standing committees, the discussion with the prime minister's office, the pushing of the Senate, the pushing of governments federally and provincially, people are paying attention. And we need people to pay attention. We need people to pay attention during this pandemic because it's the only way that we're gonna get out of this. Now, I think when I think about how governments have handled this, and the handling of the pandemic should never have been a perception of a popularity contest. It had to be science-based. There had to be consistency, there had to be leadership. And we certainly found that there was an incredible lack of all of that. And I'll say that's why we're in the difficulty that we're in today. I take a look at some of the bold, aggressive responses of other countries. I've taken a look at New Zealand that right off the bat shut it down. Put into place strong social programs. And today, the, the head of New Zealand the prime minister, she's being heralded as a visionary, as brilliant, as courageous, as a leader. So there was choices to be made. And the choices made were not to put any burden on the employers by even thinking about forcing of them to implement paid sick days. Wow. But we've learned. We've learned a lot. And so have Canadians. The last polls I looked at, Jason Kenney was at 15% approval ratings for how he handled the pandemic. 15%. Look, I could screw up every day of the week 50 times a day and I would hope that I wouldn't be at 15%. But that shows what an arrogant the behaving. I promised my comms team I wouldn't swear today. So I'm doing my best. 15% so people are getting it. They're seeing who you really cared for. In Ontario, Doug Ford sitting at 18%. Approval rating for how he handled the pandemic. Pallister is dropping like a brick. Mo still has support, but even his popularity is dropping. 
But I'm fascinating. During the pandemic, you'd think they would concentrate on solutions. But they continue to pass labor legislation that negatively impacts us. Because they want to make sure that we know 100% that it's not about workers' rights, it's about corporate rights. They've driven that point very well. And that's why we're the political animal that we are as an organization, because Jason Kenny is in our crosshairs, as is Pallister. Mo just got reelected. But we'll see what happens, because at election time, we will be there. Now, we keep hearing rumblings about the potential of a federal election. And it's interesting because when Aaron O'Toole was seeking the leadership of the Conservative Party, he kicked off his campaign in Hamilton, Ontario, and on part of his speech, he said he was going to be Jerry Dias's worst nightmare. What an honor for me. What an honor. And then when the media interviewed me and said, what do I think? I said, Aaron O'Toole, we call him Aaron O'Fool. I said, Aaron O'Toole wouldn't even hit my top 1,000 nightmares. He's so damn irrelevant. So I had a little bit of fun with him, but look at him today. He's out there talking about union jobs and, you know, strong middle class as if we're all foolish. So one thing about us, we've been hammering him. We've been hammering him on social media, hammering him in the news. And the campaign that we ran to get Aaron O'Toole's attention and everybody else's attention. We ran a campaign. It was called Protect Canada. So if you saw the TV ads about protecting Canada, uh, you were protecting Canada. Because our mindset is we're going to make sure we stain O'Toole's image before he gets a chance to create his own. And I think the campaign that we ran from coast to coast to coast did a pretty damn good job of that. So we'll see what happens if, in fact, there's a federal election. I know right now the federal liberals are running at about 10 points ahead of the conservatives. If I take a look in Alberta, you've got both Jugmeet Singh and Trudeau are scoring higher than Aaron O'Toole. I never thought I'd see that day, especially in Alberta. But things are changing and we'll see what happens. But we've got a ton of work ahead of us. But once again, Canadians are going to vote on leadership or lack of during the pandemic because too many people, too many people lost their lives. Now, as we're in to the third wave, we're into the variety of variants of which the UK variant seems to be the worst. We're seeing young people ad attack today with COVID and the variants more than they ever have been. If you look at it about a year ago, April, May of 2020, about 40% of all people impacted were 40 years or younger. Today, it's about 61% of everyone who was affected by COVID or one of the variants, 61% or 40 years and younger. I think about 17-year-old Sarah Strait from Alberta, 17. 13-year-old young woman in the greater Toronto area a week and a half ago, 13. Senseless. This makes no sense. So we've got to make sure we're doing everything we can to keep each other safe, keep our families safe. We spent a lot of time talking about social distancing, safe practices. But we're hopefully, hopefully on the home stretch here. You know, if I think about where so many of our members are being impacted, I think about our members in the forestry sector, transportation sector, mining and processing. Of course, outside of our members in healthcare, in grocery stores. You know, one thing this pandemic has really showed us who really are the, the essential workers across this country. Because I think about the workers who are historically the most disrespected, make lousy pay. 
I remember when being a grocery store worker was a great middle class job. Today, the overwhelming majority that work in grocery stores are precarious part time. So many making minimum wage or just slightly above. I think about our PSWs that were working in two, three long term care facilities that transmitted the viruses from home to another home. They work two, three jobs because all they would ever get is part time hours for their employer so that they wouldn't have to provide decent payer benefits. And so here we are 15 months plus into a pandemic and have those issues been fixed? No. There's a greater understanding but governments have a list bit of finger to protect those workers that have done so much for us. So look, you all know I can go on and on and on and on because, well, I miss you all. I haven't had a chance to talk to you in so long. But all I know is I am looking forward to the easing of the travels because I want to get out to BC. I want to walk the highway of tears. I want to get into Winnipeg. I want to get on our boat and I want to drag the red. I want to continue our incredible work face to face because like all of you, I've had enough and we've all been pushed and stretched and stressed. But I think what's kept me going and the leadership team that's on this call, my assistants, my incredible assistants, that I couldn't do this without my Lana, the RDs, the local union leadership. The only thing that frankly has kept me going through all of this is you. I have to be strong because you're strong. And you have to be strong because our members are demanding it and expecting it. And if we're not going to provide the leadership, who's going to? Who's going to stand up for those that can't? Who's going to stand up for workers across the country that are suffering today from mental illness? Who's going to do it? We are. Because we always have and we always will. And we'll get through it because we have each other. I'm so looking forward to seeing you all soon. Thank you for everything you do each and every day.